been a long time, and uh, if you're if you're joining us live online, we're glad to have you with us. We're going to continue our study in the book of 1 John. Ushers are coming around. If you have not gotten a handout, uh, they'll be around with one of those. Just show, raise your hand, and they will get to you as soon as possible. And uh, it's exciting to see people taking their first uh, steps of obedience there. Robert accepted Christ a couple weeks ago, and uh, he is uh, he is getting... Uh, he's not tarrying. And uh, if you are interested in baptism, if you've been born again and you need to follow the Lord and believers' baptism, which is the first act of obedience after someone receives Christ, uh, we don't get baptized to be saved. Uh, we are baptized the moment we trust Christ in our heart. The Spirit of God indwells us, and the Bible, quickens, the Bible tells us that the Lord quickens us. He brings us to life. And then we're, we are baptized in water to, to reveal that, uh, and show publicly that we have made that decision and that we are born again. So if you need to make that next step, next uh, month, August 8th, is our, is our scheduled time to baptize again. Just see your uh, adult Bible fellowship pastor, grab me, come forward to one of the altar calls. We'll get you connected and directed. So it's awesome to see those taking that next step. And I just want to again welcome you. If you're online this morning, join us. We're glad that you are with us. And once again, as Jeremy said, if, even if you're online, if this is your first time to join us online, uh, and you want to get connected to us, just go ahead and you can text uh, HBF guest at 94,000 as well, and uh, we will get with you as well and connect with you and send you a gift. So we're glad that you're with us. And if you were one that was like, man, I am not raising my hand in, this, in front of this uh, group of people, I'm not going to call myself out. We understand. Just make sure you give us a text there and we'll get back with you as soon as we can. And uh, we want to make sure you, uh, you are uh, at least informed and get the information that you would like to get from us. So if you have your Bibles, we turn to the book of 1 John chapter 2. We've been in uh, verses 15 through 17. We're going to be in there uh, for the next couple of weeks. This is our fourth installment on the topic, Bringing Relationships to Light. And when we were looking at 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 14, we saw the relationship uh, to the Father. And, uh, we, and now as we're looking at verses 15 through 17, uh, we have a relationship uh, to the world that needs to be made proper. And so as you're turning there, I'll remind you as well of some things that we need to be praying for as a congregation. Uh, Mark and Amy Talley are bereaved at the passing of Mark's mother last week. I want to thank those that helped with the uh, funeral dinner last Friday. And then as, uh, Pam Cox is also bereaved at the passing of her stepmother, Georgia Copeland, um, at this past week as well. And so remember the, uh, the Coxes. Also remember Paige McGuire and Abigail Engel, as that's their grandma. So uh, they'll be having the services on Tuesday night at Dickey Funeral Home, and so uh, our condolences to y'all and uh, your family as well. So uh, now you should be, by now, First John chapter 2, you should have landed there. And uh, how many of you have memorized the text? You know, I'm not going to call you out. We're not going to do that this week, so you're okay. So I hope you've memorized the text. Uh, we're going to still read it. And so if you have your uh, Bibles on, in First uh, John chapter 2, uh, in uh, verse 15, let's lay our eyeballs on the Word of God. And uh, I'm not going to ask you to stand, but if you could stand in your heart, that would be good in honor of God's Word. Let's just pause. Maybe this is a familiar passage to you, but I want to uh, look it over once more and, uh, and really meditate on it a little deeper. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to read your word. We live in a place where we can just open up our Bibles, we can come and worship, we can baptize publicly without any fear of retribution. Now, Lord, we're so thankful for that. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity this morning just to look once again at this passage and consider our relationship not only with you, not only with uh, the process of spiritual growth as we've already covered, but also, Lord, in relationship to the world. And Lord, as we walk through these passages, I pray, God, you continue to illuminate our understanding. And more than that, Lord, help us to live out the Word of God as it convicts our heart and teaches us all things whatsoever you've said to us. We pray, God, a blessing on the reading and the hearing of your Word, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So just by way of review, if you're just joining us, we took some time last week in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15, and that passage there where it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And we, we saw that, obviously, that is a command, not a suggestion. 
Uh, we saw that, uh, we're the, to love, that we're not to love the things that are in the world, and we took some time and, and kind of focused on uh, how Achan uh, saw something that he really loved. He saw a, a Babylonian garment, he, he saw some gold, some silver, and he hid those things right in the tent floor. And so we saw that that did not go well for him nor the nation of Israel. And so uh, this is a warning from John not to love the things of this world. All right, so we talked a lot about that last week. And then uh, we left off talking about who do you love? That was the challenge, right? Who do we love? Uh, and if we love God, we'll certainly love uh, one another. We'll love his word. We looked at several things that we will love uh, if we love him, and that's the things we should be loving. But this morning, I want to go to our next point, which you should have if you have an outline and you're following along there. Uh, our second point is we need to look to scriptures for definition. Because when you talk about the world, uh, even within the context of the Bible, that can be a little confusing. Most of us know John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world. Well, if God loved the world, why does he tell us not to love the world, right? That could be a contradiction. Well, I'm here to help define that for you this morning because there's some distinctions there. He says in 1 John 2.15, of course, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Uh, <clears throat> and then he adds to that, um, neither, uh, if, if any man loved the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Well, that's kind of, that'll make you stop, okay? You're like, man, I don't want to love the world then because I want to have the love of the Father in me. And as he gets down to verse 17, you know, it talks about how the world will perish and how we need to, uh, we can't love this world or we're going to go with it. So those are things that are very, uh, you know, important to understand. And if, if we can't love the world on one hand, uh, you know, then why in the world did the Father love the world? Well, I'm going to help you figure all that out. How many of you know those cynics out there that'll say, well, you can't believe the Bible because it contradicts itself, right? Uh huh. You'll hear that all the time. I just want you to know this is a principle Bible study. When you see a principle or a precept or something like this that appears to be a contradiction, that's when you got to dig in deeper because it's always where God's going to illuminate something that you need to understand. So a lot of times, uh, well, not all the time, all the time when you think there's a, when it appears like there's a contradiction, um, it's always a place in the Bible that actually illuminates something much deeper. And uh, I just had a, I had a Bible study text question several months ago from some kids and they were asking me a question. They had gone through a lot of uh, uh, apologetics and they could answer most of the questions, but they came across one that kind of tripped them up. And so I taught them um, in a text the, 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 the principle of full mention. Sometimes God only gives you a little light on a passage and it causes you to go, what's that talking about? So you'll study the topic fully from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, you'll hear me often talk about first mention and or last mention, right? Which is also very important where something begins and you see it the first time in the Bible is often where it's defined and and conversely, when you get to the, the last mention of it, it'll also help illuminate that or even contrast something between a, a dispensation or uh, an age or whatever. There's all kinds of neat things that, that God does to illuminate his word. But another, the, uh, one of the things that you can see when you come across a contradiction is make sure you study uh, the full mention, right? Look at all the different passages in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation so you can understand what God's trying to, to uh, teach you. Now, in this discussion of the world, uh, I'm not going to go through every mention of the world in the Bible. We would be here all day. Uh, but I will give you some examples of what I'm talking about. And the first thing that you don't have to do, well, point A, if you're on your notes, is, is note the distinctions in the way the word world is defined. If you study the, the, the word itself, world, and by the way, every word of God is important in the Bible. And we're not studying concepts we're studying what does the Word of God say. God has preserved His Word for us so we can have His words, plural. I mean, He has preserved the Bible for us word for word, so we know that it is, it is preserved for us. So we study the words of Scripture, and so we note the distinctions in the way the word world is defined as we go from the Bible through Genesis to Revelation. Now, in this uh, discussion this morning, I'm just going to keep it in the New Text Testament context, but... Uh, it would apply for the Old Testament as well. And so, note the distinction of the way the word world is defined. Now, point one here, the Greek is, is of no help. This is kind of neat, because oftentimes you'll hear preachers like, well, in the Greek, and that makes you feel like, well, I don't know Greek, so I don't, can't understand the Bible. Well, there's nothing that, there's, that's absolutely not true at all. You have the Bible in your language. All you have to do is study it, and God will show you what it says. This is a case where if you studied in the Greek, it would make a, a, a hill of beans difference. There's no hidden meaning. There's no, there's no nuance. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Greek word is cosmos, which you guys, have, you know, you're familiar with, cosmos. And it really doesn't, it doesn't, that's where it's at. Same mention everywhere. And you have, to, you have to go and look at what's around that word to understand what it's really referring to. And so uh, the word 
uh, world is defined by its usage in the text in both the Greek and the English. So there are at least three distinctions of the way the wor- word world is used. Excuse me, I'm going to get tongue-tied on this before it's over with. Uh, and as we can c- compare Scripture with Scripture, and iron sharpens iron, we're able to, to see this. So there are, there's three distinctions. And the first one, of course, is the world is equated to the planet Earth. And you don't have to be a rocket science, scientist to know that. Uh, in Acts chapter 17 and verse 24, the Bible says, God hath made the world and all the things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temple made with hands. So Paul is giving that great message on Mars Hill, and he appeals to the fact that the Creator God has made the world. You know, I've been in, I remember one of, one of my fondest memories was being in the Himalayan mountains with, uh, um, down near the Chitwan Valley with Pastor Carl Silva and watching him stop at a village and preach the gospel. And that's where he started. Uh, even a Hindu can get that concept. God made the world and all the things therein. And that's where he started. And, and uh, before it was over, there was a whole village of Hindus, uh, you know, trusting Jesus as Lord and Savior. is amazing. And so that is the first, uh, you know, simple definition. And that's not rocket science, I know. Uh, the second one is the world is equated to humanity. Now, this is uh, also something that if you've studied your Bible, this stuff is kind of common sense. But but it's good to look at it and realize that the Word of God is what defines the words in the Bible. First John 2, 2, we already covered this at the beginning of this chapter. And uh, when we, we were looking at uh, uh, John addressing his little children, he says, My little children, <clears throat> um, uh, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And then he goes on to say, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also the sins of the whole world. Okay, so what's he talking about there, the sins of the whole world? Is he talking about the trees and the rocks and the, and the streams and the birds? Is that what he's talking about? What do you think? No, no, he's not. He's not talking about the created world. He's talking about the humanity, isn't he? He's talking about humanity. Uh, and, of course, that's also the world that's referred to that many of us are familiar with in 1 John chapter 3, one of the first memory verses I ever had before I was even a Christian. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, he's talking about humanity. However, the redemption of humanity, we know from Romans, does impact the redemption of the world. That's why creation is groaning, waiting for the redemption of of the sons of God, our, cha- our nature being changed and eventually us being changed not just internally but even externally has an impact on creation and this world. And so <clears throat> you can kind of see different layers there too. It's kind of interesting. So in, in John chapter 1 and verse 10, we see that the word uh, world is used to represent both humanity and the planet earth. So in John chapter uh, 1 and verse 10, which I think I put on the screen for you, you're going to see here that this is a case where both instances are being used. He says, he was in the world, Jesus Christ, right? And the, and, and the world, meaning the, the planet Earth, was made by him. Jesus Christ made the world. He spoke the worlds into existence. You say, well, I thought God did that. That's what I just said. And so, uh, so Jesus Christ spoke the world into existence. And, and he made the world, the Earth. It was made by him. And the world... Right? The world knew him not. Well, who, who didn't know him? Well, sinful men, right? Men did not know him. So he's talking about humanity. So in that case, you can see that he's dealing with the planet Earth. He's also dealing with the humans. Uh, in that sense, the world is likened to humans, sinful humans who did not recognize him. So that moves us to the next point, which is the world is equated to a spiritual world system that's directly against God. Now, that is the third instance, and that's the one that we see. Uh, here in Second John, or uh, First John, chapter two, verses fifteen through seventeen. Uh, as a matter of fact, the first mention of the world um, in the book of First John is in chapter two, in verse one, dealing with um, you know the humanity. But when you get to this uh, this section here in verses fifteen through seventeen, uh, you'll see the word world mentioned six times, and in every instance, uh, every one of those times, it's dealing with a wicked uh, world system. It's a, a spiritual world system that is directly against God. And uh, we've covered the passage over and over, so you understand that. The world, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, 
uh, but uh, is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And that's a lot of discussion about this wicked world system. So why is that? Why is he getting all focused on the world? Because he's fixing in the next verse when we get there, in uh, verse 18, to tell his little children about the Antichrist and the spirit of Antichrist that, that uh, already works. And so we'll spend a lot of the rest of our time in 1 John dealing with this Antichrist. And so uh, we'll talk about that later, but I just want to point that out because the word world is mentioned six times, which is the number of man and, and, uh, in, this, in this section in verses 15 through 17. And the next verse in John here is going to deal with the king of the children of pride, uh, the coming man of sin, uh, the, the one who will lead the world actively and has been leading the world actively and its people into destruction. And so he is very, very clear about that. There is a son of perdition associated with a number in Revelation 13 and verse 8. <clears throat> and what is that number? Six, 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 right? And so, and so we still understand, we use the, the concept that there is a, a world out there. It's a system, right? You have the world. Uh, what, there used to be that show, dun, 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 uh, what is it, the agony of defeat, and the thrill of victory, the agony of defeat, like Conor McGregor. And so, yeah, the wide world of sports, <laughs> wide world of sports. And, um, and then, you know, Kansas City has the world of wheels, they used to. And then we celebrate the World Series. Well, we're not talking about the planet Earth. I mean, the World Series is only dealing with America, right? And a couple teams in Canada. Does Canada even have any more teams? And so, uh, and so the world, you know, it talks about a system, a system. Um, and so um, now this is a system that God wants us to be aware of. He mentions it six times. John mentions it six times in three verses. Uh, and he wants us uh, to understand some things about this world system. And how, which is what we're talking about, bringing relationships to light, how we are to relate to it, or in this case, how we're not to relate to it, right? There are some things you don't want to be related to, and that is this world system. And so uh, Jesus was born into the world system as a man, but he was, never, uh, he was never of this world, even though he was in this world. And uh, I'm not saying that he is. In John chapter 8 and verse 23, this is what Jesus said, and he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above, ye are of this world, I am not of this world. Well, what do you mean you're not of this world? He was on the earth. I mean, he lived. We, we preach that all day long. Uh, of course he was on the earth, and this, he was in the world, right? Uh, oh, your Bible contradicts itself, so you just got to throw it away. No, what, God, what he's pointing out is there is a world system. There's a world system, and Jesus, is, he was on this earth, but he was not part of it. Because, by the way... He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There's a parallel system, and it's trying to overthrow his system that he's established. And I wish I had more time. We could go all the way back to Genesis chapter 2, and we could see there's a reason why Satan showed up in the garden. And it wasn't just because he hated Adam and Eve. It's because he hated God. And he did not want to see the kingdom uh, that God had established in, in his absence go forward because he was disqualified. And so... Uh, and so he's been actively fighting against God with his own system, his own world system. And uh, so it's not something new. It's not something that just happened with Karl Marx. It's not something that just happened, you know, in the Dark Ages or just something happened with the advent of the Roman Empire or the Persian Empire uh, or Nimrod, uh, although those are great landmarks. Uh, this goes all the way back to the fall, right? And there's a system. There's a system that the devil is employing to combat God. The good news is uh, we're on the victorious side. And so the planet and its inhabitants are to be loved. That's your word there, loved, because we seek their redemption. So I don't want you to misunderstand this. So we can get an attitude like, and by the way, there's a reason the Baptists are called bad attitude Baptists, right? So we can get these attitudes, man. Man, we don't love the world. We hate the world. And, and there's some wisdom in that, right? We are to, we are to, love the things that God loves, and we're to hate the things that God hates. But at the end of the day, we got to be careful in our definitions, especially when we're talking about hating the world. Okay, what does that really mean? Well, the world system, certainly, you and I should hate it. We should hate those things that, that fight, that, that, that compete against God, that corrupt humanity. But at the end of the day, we got to understand John 3, 16, God so loved the world. So how does that all reconcile? Well, I'm glad you asked. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17, the Bible says, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. 
And so why is this important, Brian? Well, I don't know. I'm just trying to fill time. No, I'm not really. Uh, no, so back in, when, when, John, when John was writing this, right, it was the first century. And there were these Gnostics. I talked about that in my introduction. Some of the reasons that he was writing. There were people who actually believed that all physical matter was evil. Right? So this appealed to what became known as mysticism. And only the Gnostics, only the people with the secret hidden knowledge could have this mystical relationship with God Almighty. Folks like you and me, we're just losers. We're sorry. We're not in the club. You're out of there. Right? Access to God even though the Bible is very clear, there's one mediator, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And, and any man can access him by simply calling upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Uh, very clear that God wants to access every man individually. Uh, the Gnostics were, were actually using knowledge. That's where the word Gnostic comes from. Uh, and, and they were using that to, to elevate themselves. In, in the book of Revelation, if you are going through our Wednesday night series on church history, we'll talk about the Nicolaitans. They would put themselves above the laity, right? They'd put themselves in a position through their knowledge. And so, uh, and this knowledge happened to be mystical. One of the heresies that many of them got into was believing that the physical matter was, was all evil because they didn't rightly divide the word. They didn't compare scripture with scripture and they didn't look at full mention, right? We just ran through it in a few minutes and we're all set. See, That's how, we didn't even need the Greek. And so they just, they, they met, they met, so you have guys castrating themselves because of their, their sex drive. Uh, you have people that, 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 that are, are uh, getting into what's called asceticism, where they're beating themselves and, and, and beating themselves and, and punishing themselves because, well, man, they're, they're evil. Their flesh is evil. Now, let me, let me, let me di- I'm digress and get back where I'm going. There was a guy named Manny out of Persia who really, a couple centuries later, who put this thing on steroids. And uh, he ended up getting martyred, but, uh, or getting killed. But <clears throat> the bottom line is Satan has always uh, had, this, uh, had different ways to attack uh, the, the truth of God's word. And, and Manny stated, <clears throat> started this cult that, that believed that the material world was all evil. And he just picked that up actually from um, the Orient, from uh, Eastern religions, the same Buddhism and all of those things that they still worship or they, that are still going on today looking for that higher mystical meaning to everything, uh, and, and teaching that matter itself was evil. So Jesus made it clear in his ministry, and Paul made it clear here in 1 Timothy 6, 7 that I just quoted, that's not the case at all. Even though all men are born sinners because of their endemic nature, we understand that God the Father values all men, which is why he sent his Son to die on the cross in our stead. Therefore, we are, we are to love our enemies, even though we are to be separated from their evil activities. And so, literally, that's what God does to us the moment we get saved. We ask Christ into our heart. He comes in, and it's a spiritual circumcision. He separates our soul from our flesh, right? Our fle- in our flesh, the Bible does say, dwelleth no good thing. And so, that is also true. But Matthew five forty four, Jesus said, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. So, that's what God's talking about when I, when I say love the world. We're, we're to love those that hate, hate us, those that also hate God. In Luke 6, 27, the Bible says, But I say unto you, uh, <clears throat> which here, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you. Uh, Luke six thirty five says, But love your enemies and do good <clears throat> and lend, hoping for, for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and ye shall be, be the children of the highest, for he is... He that is kind to the unthankful and to the evil, be therefore, uh, I'm sorry, he is unkind to the unthankful and to the evil, be ye therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. So what happens is there's something that happens in our nature when we get saved. If you're born again this morning, uh, your nature changes on the inside. You become someone who loves, who can love people that hate you, who love people that are evil. That doesn't mean you like what they're doing. That doesn't mean... You like what they're doing any more than you like what your flesh wants to do. Our, and our flesh dwells no good thing. So in that sense, uh, we do have a dual nature for sure. But at the end of the day, um, God is going to, he values every man and every woman and their soul. That's why he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross. And because humanity, because the world as humanity is valuable to God the Father, then it should be valuable to us. That doesn't mean we go along with everything the world does. Uh, absolutely not. God forbid. God forbid. 
You know, how shall we continue in sin? Right? Or should we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we continue? Uh, how did I? I'm just butchering that. Let's, let me read it. Uh, first uh, Romans. So what happens. I get off my notes and then I misquote the Bible. So there you go. Uh, Romans chapter 6 is what I'm quoting. Uh, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God for, forbid. How shall we? <clears throat> That's where I'm stuck. How's, there we go. Thank you, Ron. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? That's right, isn't it? Now I'm going to read it to make sure. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Amen. That's what I was wanting to say, but my brain got blocked. So <clears throat> he goes on to talk about baptism. And, uh, and so after that, we just saw some baptism. That's really what baptism is all about, isn't it? It's a, it's a public manifestation and a declaration that God has brought us into him, and now we are in Christ. Uh, or we're, he's in us, and we're in Christ, and, that, and we identify with him through his spirit, and he identifies with us on the cross. He died on the cross for our sins and became the propitiation, right, the replacement for our sins, 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. All right, so uh, what does all that mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. 1 John chapter 3, John deals with this a little bit further. Uh, because our spiritual nature in Christ is on display when we love our brothers and when we love our enemies. There's something about love, which we've talked a lot about already in the previous verses, that really contrasts this world system. And when, it, when we're loving God and we're loving people, as we talked about that great commandment the last few weeks, um, man, I tell you what, it, it does some, some defeating of the enemy. It's a mighty blow uh, to the, the adversary in this world system. We are commanded to love our wives. We're commanded to love our children and our family and our friends in the New Testament. I'm not going to look up all those verses for time's sake, but you could look at Ephesians 5.22, Ephesians 6, 1 and 2, John 15.13, and there's many more verses. But brotherly love is a, is a strong virtue that is, mani- is a manifestation of the Spirit of God and a component of how the church is built. And we've talked about that in the weeks past, right? The first, the first thing you see in the fruit of the Spirit, by definition, is love. And then we also talked about how the body is built in love. In Ephesians 4.16, we're, we're to edify one another in love. So John encourages those who are filled with God's love to use the resources of this material world, right, to be a blessing to others. Well, how can that be if the material is evil? It's not the material that's evil. That's why God's focusing on redeeming man. It's not the material, right? It's how our wicked hearts use it, right? It's how we employ it. And so... Now that we have a new nature, he says, oh, well, now you have Christ in you, the hope of glory. You can use the material world as a blessing. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 17, But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? In that passage, he's saying, if, you, if it's in, as it says in Proverbs even, in the Old Testament, if it's in thine hand to do good, do it. Not only that, he's saying literally, if you have something in your possession that is of value, use it for your brother. So if it was evil, obviously, then you couldn't do that. But it, it, that's not the point. The point is, that's not what he's talking about. So as John was, was laying this out, he's also addressing some doctrinal uh, heresies that are already, already being planted in the first century church. And so you've got to be very careful because there's still a lot of people out there teaching. Actually, I looked it up on, the, on you, this, this heresy, this one in particular that I'm talking about about how all matter is evil, is actually recycled. I just found it today. The first things in the search engine were not about the, the Manichians or uh, about the false doctrine. It was actually about the current uh, revelation that all the matter in the world is evil and we need a mystical relationship with God, blah, 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 blah. The same old, same old that's been circulating since the first century. All right? Actually, before the first century. So, uh, so <clears throat> we are not to love the world system that opposes God and our new nature. This is very clear in 1 John 2, 15 through 17. So I've, I've ta- I just want to make sure that there are that we, we love people because God loved people, right? And I know I'm beating a dead horse, but this is so important. Because today, we're, we're gonna, no matter what, you're going to get crucified for following Jesus. That's what happens, right? And so you've got to learn to love your enemy. And, and so, and so you, that is so important. So we are not to love the world system that opposes God. So there are some things that you are not to love, and that is the world system that opposes God and our new nature in Christ. Because there is some things in this world that that are absolutely contradictory to who you are as a Christian. 
Uh, and that's very clear, <clears throat> and I'm not going to take a lot of time here to lay this out because it's so clear in verse 15. The lust of the flesh, right? The lust of the eyes and the pride of life. It's just that simple. That's point B. So these are the, the areas Satan tempted Adam and Eve in, in Genesis 3, 4 through 6. And the serpent said unto the woman <clears throat> in Genesis 3 and verse 4, uh, that old wily serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You know, the devil says, you know, you don't really know everything that you need to know, because I have secret knowledge that you don't have, which is not actually true at all. All he had was lies. The knowledge they needed was found in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. Everything they needed to know. You can have all the trees of the garden you can freely eat, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat of it. The day they eat thereof, you shall surely die. God didn't hold back anything from them. He told them everything they needed to know. It wasn't a secret. He said, hey, look, you don't need that. It's going to hurt you. Don't touch it. Or no, he didn't say don't touch it. Oops, I just made a mistake. I misquoted the Bible. He said, don't eat of it. Eve's the one who inserted don't touch it, and she got in trouble. And so, and so that, you know what happened in verse 6. And when the woman, there it is, she saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, she had the lust of the eyes. And the tree was de, uh, to be desired to make one wise. She had the pride of life. And she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And there it was, the lust of the flesh. As soon as she ate of that thing. And gave also unto her husband with her. And he did eat. And so you know what happened from there. Uh, all of a sudden they find themselves in their relationship to light. Jesus Christ, the light of the world, has now been messed up. And they are running and hiding. And they're covering up their nakedness. And all of these, these repercussions occur because they did not obey God's word. There was a system that was being imposed there. And it was to doubt and undermine the word of God as God had established it. So point C, there are three, there, there are three areas Satan uh, tempted Adam and Eve in. And, when, and you know what? There are three areas that Satan tempted Christ in as well. In Luke 4 and verses, verses 1 through 14. Now we don't have time to look at all of it in detail, but... If you, uh, if you want to turn over in your Bible and look at the text, there's a lot there to look at. I'll have some verses on the board, but you want to lay your eyes on this real quick. Uh, Luke chapter 4, <clears throat> uh, Jesus is, is here, and he's, he's, uh, he's full of the Holy Ghost, and he returned from Jordan as he was led in the Spirit in the wilderness. So his earthly ministry is beginning, and the Bible says he's 40 days tempted of the devil. And uh, in those days he didn't eat anything, and he was hungry, and the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. In Luke chapter 4 and verse 3. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. You see, that's where the battle's at. If you, want to, if you really want to make sure you have victory over this world system, you believe every word of God. Of God, the devil wants you not to believe every word of God. So, uh, the lust of the flesh is where Jesus was attacked in Luke four verses three through four. But it didn't stop there. In Luke uh, four and verse five, the text goes on to say, "And the devil, uh, taking him up into a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it." Wow, man, that's pretty impressive. If, if thou therefore wilt worship me, all, that be, uh, all shall be thine. And of course, verse 8, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is, what is it? Written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So at every, at, at every turn, Jesus had a passage and understood to contextualize the lie and, and the temptation to put it, uh, squarely where it needed to be. So here we see that he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment. I mean, he just says, there, here it is, and magnified that. What was he appealing to? Well, pride of life, but also the eyes, right? He showed it to him, and he could see it. And so there he's dealing with the, the lust of the eyes. And then as we move on, uh, we see in the, the pride of life down in verse 9. He says, so he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. You know, if you, say who, if you are who you say you are, just cast yourself down right now. And he says in verse 10, For it is written, 
He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. So the devil's no fool. He uses the word of God too. Did you know that? He's not, he, he uses the Bible. He twists the Bible more than anybody you're ever going to meet. He says, hey, Jesus, cast yourself down because your word says, and he's right. That's what the word of God says in Isaiah. And then he says, uh, for it is written, he shall give the angels charge over thee to keep thee, verse 11, and their hands uh, they shall bear thee up, lest any man, any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, it is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil ended all, <coughs> had uh, ended all temptation, he departed from him for a season. And so he resisted the devil. The Bible tells us, resist the devil and he will flee. How do you resist the devil? How do you resist the world system? Well, it's the word of God. You have no defenses, right? You're like a city broken down without walls if the word of God is not dwelling in you. And I might add richly. Because the amount of the world, the flesh, and the devil that's being foisted on your mind in this particular generation, uh, since the, we've gone from the, uh, the computer, we went from the space age to the uh, computer age to the information age, and now the data is just flowing. And we better have this data going through our hearts and our minds, else uh, we will be like cities broken down without walls. We will not be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And so this is really important stuff because the same place that he tempted Adam and Eve is the same place he's gonna, he tempted Christ, which is the same place he's, he tempts us to this very day. And so it's the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now we know where John found the order, the description in 1 John 2 and verse 16 because the order that he applies in 1 John 2, 16 is the one that Jesus faced in Luke chapter 4. And so we come to the next point, which is the world will tempt you in all three of these areas. You better believe it because you have an adversary. And that's the thing that's a wake-up call. The reason that Paul, John is writing this is he's saying, look, guys, there is an adversary. There is a world system. There is something that you need to be aware of. You have an adversary. Christians must wake up and realize they are in a cosmic conflict. The day that you trusted Christ as Lord and Savior, you chose an enemy, and his name is Satan. Uh, whether you knew it or not. Satan is the, is the prince of this world system. In John 12, 31, Jesus said, Now is the judgment of this world, <clears throat> uh, and now shall the prince of this world be cast out. That's a threat. So, so Jesus has told him, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to crush your head in Genesis 3, and now he says, I'm going to cast you out. Well, he's already been, he's already been cast down, but he's going to get cast out all right. He's going to be thrown into the lake of fire in due time. So Satan has organized his forces against your, what we call, beloved, especially among Christian circles, your world view. How many times have you heard that in Christian circles, right? If, you, uh, if you're around very long and you study, a lot of times you'll hear the world view, world view, world view. There's a biblical world view, and then there's, a, there's all kinds of other world views. That's your concept of, of who created everything, who is the king of kings and lord of lords, and, and everything that, that, that uh, the, all authority comes from God. That's the world view that comes from the scripture. There's no other authority that's higher than God. God is the ultimate authority. And so there's all kinds of competing world views. And so Satan uh, is the prince of this world system that is being talked about here in, Gen in a, a second, or 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. So Satan has organized his forces against your worldview. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11, a very familiar passage it's such a big deal that Paul says, hey, don't just, don't just lollygag into this thing. Make sure you put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Right? He's wily. Remember seeing wily coyote, right? He's always trying to, to get a roadrunner to, to mess up. Well, he says, I need you to be like roadrunner, right? So may, put on the whole armor of God because this dude, is, he's, a lot, he's a lot smarter than that old coyote. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And that's, that's a mouthful. There's a lot, I could just park there and go on for quite a while right there. But this is what you have to learn uh, in every relationship. You really don't wrestle flesh and blood. You wrestle spiritual wickedness in high places. And so when, you, when there's something going on in your world, make sure you kind of get that down. There's a bigger spiritual battle that's going on. And, and as, as the days grow darker, it becomes very important that the Bible-believing Christians align themselves with a person, not a party. You following what I'm saying? Who does Brian Hedges align himself? Oh, well, that's easy. The Lord Jesus Christ, the light of the world. That's the absolute standard. 
uh, because that's the only person that's going to actually save you from anything is the Lord Jesus Christ. The, system of this, the systems of this world are not designed to protect us. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can protect us and provide for us. In fact, that's what makes you so dangerous to the world system. It's that you have already won the battle through Christ. You are, you are already a conqueror. That's what Romans 8 very clearly tells us. We are already victorious. What makes a Christian so, so, just, so, so uh, dangerous to this world system that he's talking about that attacks the, 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 the flesh and the, the eyes and the pride of life is that we've already got the victory through Jesus Christ. Jesus won. And now we're on the winning team. And so, um, you're, you cannot be influenced. Well, at least that's the hope. And so, this commitment to the faith is, is viewed as obstinate and rebellion by the world system. Is it not? Now, for many, many years in this country, you didn't even know because we had a because we had so much, the Bible had so much influence in generations past. But as the information age kicks up, right, your worldview, your biblical worldview, is not only being contested on the right, but being contested on the left. And so it's so important that you, as a Christian, understand, where do I stand? Well, that's pretty simple. We stand with who? Christ. We stand with his word. Well, who do I hate? Nobody. I love the world because God gave me his spirit. What do I hate? Oh, well, okay, I could give you a long list of what I hate. I hate the world system because it's, it's fighting against God. And so these are important things. And let me just give you some examples from the, from the Bible so you can kind of wrap your head around it in the time we have left. And we're almost done. But in Esther, there was a gentleman named w- uh, Wicked Haman, and he was a principality. As a matter of fact, he was wanting to get cozied up next to the, to the king, Ahasuerus. I mean, he was looking to, to exalt himself, right? He was dealing with principalities and powers and, uh, man, he was all about it. But little did he know that little Queen Esther uh, was, uh, was the, uh, the niece of Mordecai. Now, Mordecai was a guy who he hated. Uh, who was Mordecai? Well, he was in Persia, well, in, in India. And, uh, and so uh, these guys, uh, the, Mordecai was a, was a Jew that had been uh, dispersed. And he was still faithful to follow God's word, follow the law of Moses, right? And he was still obedient to worship God. And so when Mordecai would, or I mean, wicked Haman would come by and, and, and he would want everyone to worship him, what did Mordecai do? He just stood. Why? Because he couldn't worship men. He, was, he had to worship God. He wasn't going to worship this wicked man. It just wasn't going to happen. And so the Bible tells us in Esther 3, 5, And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. He was angry. Why? Because Mordecai had a higher authority. And it, and it, come, it came off as, well, rebellious because he wanted to be the authority. Now, the king was the authority, not, not wicked Haman. In Daniel chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar, he couldn't stand for it either. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they, they defied the most powerful man on the planet. And he came unglued in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, after, I'll just give you a little context for time's sake. So they build, the, they have this huge uh, a pagan idol and they're stoking it with fire and they're, th- and they're throwing sacrifices on it and, and, and he wants them to bow down and worship this thing. And they're like, nah, we're not going to do that. And the king's like, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you. This is a paraphrase, you can go back and read it. And uh, they're like, well, that's okay, King. We appreciate that, but we're not doing that. So, so he, it says in Daniel 3, verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom, whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And so Nebuchadnezzar said, you know, I really respect your, your convictions, man. I, I, I like a man that'll stick with his convictions. Is that what Nebuchadnezzar did? No, no. Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he did not like that because they were claiming there was a higher authority than him. And so he says, that then, then was Nebuchadnezzar, the word of God says, he was full of fury. And the form of his visage changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace, um, 
one seven times more than it was uh, want to be heated. He's like, overheat that thing. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men uh, were bound in their coats, their hosen and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. You know their attitude was, hey, you know what? If God saves us, he saves us, and if he doesn't, we, we die. Why? Because we'd rather die serving the Lord than compromising. Now, why do I bring this up? Well, because the context of this passage also deals with people that are going to be going into the tribulation in days to come. And it's going to be important that they do not take the mark of the beast. It's important that they do not uh, bow to that, that power. And so this kind of has a dual application. And you can see from the Old Testament examples, there's been many times when people simply say, you know what, I'm going with God, even if it kills me. But what happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? We know what happened. God saved them. And eventually, Nebuchadnezzar himself became a believer. And so... You know what they did? They didn't rebel other than in that one area. Other than that, they were solid. They, they, did, they, they, they went along as far as they could, but when it came to worshiping anyone other than God, they were like, I'm out. I'm out. And this is important. The world, the world will, will tempt you in three areas. Why? Because the world hates you. In 1 John chapter 3, and I'm talking about the world system, system he says in verse 13, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. In John chapter 17 and verse 13, he says, now, now, uh, And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have, <clears throat> I'm sorry, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Now earlier I told you that Jesus said, I'm not of this world. He's praying for his disciples. He says, Lord, I'm not of the world, and they're not of the world. I don't, want to take, I don't want to take them out of the world. So what does that mean? Beloved, listen, when we follow God and we love God and we love people, guess what? We become otherworldly. You don't have to wait for the flying saucers to land. The people from heaven are already here, and it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. I mean, we are, we have Christ in us. That seems... Well, it seems crazy. That's why in the first century they called us Christians because we all believe that Jesus Christ lived in us, little Christ. And you know what? They, and that was lived out. But don't marvel when the world hates you. How many of you can remember when you hated the world or you hated Christians? A few of you. Man, you guys are either really wonderful people or you're not honest. And I don't know. But, I, man, I can give you examples. As a matter of fact, I had a cool thing happen. This is, I'm going to kill my time here. This really happened to me. I forgot about this. I haven't had a chance to tell. This is a new story. I haven't had a chance to tell. So I was up at, uh, I was up at, uh, uh, I've told this story before when I was a little kid, I, and I was like in the fifth grade, Alex Jamie's tried to share a track with me, and I just berated that kid uh, just because I was lost, and I hated the light. I, 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 I felt, I, I just remember this, you know, demonic hatred. I don't know what else to call it. I just, just hated the kid for that. And I liked him otherwise. He's a great guy. So I'm up at, I had a meeting up in Indiana for, for, something, for something with wounded spirits. And uh, Dave Madden, a friend of mine uh, from Grace Church up in Lee Summit, he brings a, a guy with him, car ride guy, and, and I'm visiting with him. And he says, hey, uh, I said, I'm Brian Hedges. And he says, and he says uh, I'm Jesse James. And I'm like, Jesse James? You can't be Jesse James. Not Jesse James the... No, not the outlaw. But the descendant of the outlaw who used to live across the street from me when I was a little kid. The brother of Alex James. And it's, yeah, that's me. I'm like, dude, I remember... And we went down memory lane. I said, I, t I got to do this. I said, hey, I want you to tell your... This has been bothering me since I got saved, you know, 30-some years ago. Just tell your brother Alex that when he witnessed to me on the back of that bus, it wasn't for naught. And let him know I'm sorry for the way I treated him. So I got to send that message. That's just a couple, like about six weeks ago. So by the, praise the Lord. But I can, I'm telling you, uh, so the, the, what did I get off on that tangent? Because, because I can remember when I was lost, Christians who walked in the light, man, I just, I just didn't like it. I used to go to church, for Six Mile Baptist Church, and I remember... I'd go, and I liked it, and it was, uh, the Lord was working on me. I was a junior high kid. And then one Sunday, I find myself, I can't even go up to the service. I'm outside waiting for it to get over. I'm standing outside. Just, I just don't even want to go in. What was that all about? I'll tell you what it was about. 
I was hating God. I was hating the people of God because my flesh was fighting me. And boy, it was a, took me a few more years before I finally bowed my knee and confessed Christ as Lord and Savior. I'm telling you, there's a world system. And uh, I, I remember what it was like to be a part of it. I remember being an evangelist for the devil. I, 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 I know what it's like to be lost. And if you know what it's like to be lost, I tell you what, there's something about the Bible and the Word of God, and it just penetrates your heart, and God calls you to himself. Against everything that's natural, God wants you to be supernatural, and you can only find that through Jesus Christ. It's not an act. It's not a show. It's the real deal. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's amazing. Okay, so the world will, will keep you... Uh, the, world, the world will tempt you, I'm sorry, um, in all three areas because of your old nature. In Ephesians 2, the Bible tells us that we have, if you're born again, you have an old nature and you have a new nature. That's where Manny was a little bit close because there is a dual nature. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. That's what I was just sharing with you, my testimony of doing that. According to the prince of the power of the air. That means the powers of this world had influence, and I was going right along. I can remember the, the people that God loves are the people that I hated. Even as a kid, I'd watch the news, and I was rooting for the wrong team in world politics and geopolitical affairs. When it came to, to life, I was on the wrong side of the life issue. Why? Because, well, I love death. There's, it was in my nature. There was a time before Christ, man. That's the way it was. We walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and the power of the air, the spirit that right now worketh in the children of disobedience, among, among whom also you all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. You know what you'll find common in most lost people is that they're angry. They're angry. Our biggest enemy is not from without. Beloved, it's from within. The world out there is not your... That's not the scary part of being a Christian. It's what's hanging on your bones. It's the flesh. Paul said in Romans 7, as he talked about wrestling with the flesh, he came to a great conclusion. He says, I find then a law that when I, sh I would be good, evil is present with me. This is as a Christian. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. On the inside, man, I'm, I'm, I'm going after it. But I see another law in my members, right, in, in my body, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity, the law of sin, which is in my members. Then he says, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? That's a question that he answers in verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, with the flesh, the law of sin. And I tell you what, the victory is in Christ. The flesh loves sin, but you know what? When you're a new creature in Christ, it, there's something about the Spirit. It thirsts for righteousness. It thirsts for truth. It searches for Christ. And everything about technology, by, by the way, beloved, is designed to appeal to the lust of your eyes, the lust of the, well, the, lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I've mentioned the communication age. We all need to do some inventory. Oh, little eyes. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. And I'm not just talking about stuff that, you know, is obviously across the lines. I'm talking about just the preponderance of data that's from this world system. We need to be careful. To, to, I was thinking about this as I was preparing this message. Uh, how much time do we spend listening to, tech, to our technical uh, technology, feeding our flesh, data, information, television, videos, um, emails and texts, distractions, versus feeding ourselves the Word of God? Our souls. And man, I tell you what, I'm, a, I'm your pastor and I'm, I'm a little ashamed to admit it. I mean, I need to be spending more time meditating, thinking there's so many distractions. Our minds look like a, like a switch in a, in, a, in a router or something in a computer room with all the little lights beeping, all the signal, all the traffic moving, you know, just going all the time. You know, we need to turn all the lights green and we need to let the word of God go right into our hearts. And, uh, and so uh, just be careful what we allow in our minds, in our hearts, in our lives. Because I tell you what, the Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 12, the wicked desireth the net of evil men, but the root of righteousness yieldeth fruit. There's a net out there. And I tell you what, you don't need to desire all the things that are in the net. Uh, you're never, I, I, would not, I would not bite on Bitcoin. I would not get caught up in all, whatever the schemes are out there, man. Just, just 
Stick to the truth. Stick to truth. Stick to the word of God. Ecclesiastes 9, 12 says, For man also knoweth not his time, as the fishes are taken in an evil net, and as the birds that are caught in snares, so are the sons of man snared in an evil time when it falleth suddenly upon them. You see, the danger of technology is it can deliver everything your flesh and your eyes and your prideful life desires. They've done tests. You get enough likes, you get enough this and that, then the dopamine goes up in your mind and you're allowing that thing to control your emotions. Man, there ain't nothing that should control our emotions other than God's word, the truth of God's word. Because the whole world lies in wickedness. You know what? The world will tempt you in all these areas because it lies in wickedness. And we know that we are of God and the whole world lies in wickedness. The whole world has made its bed. It lies in wickedness. The only way to avoid making your bed in this world is to make peace with God. So let me ask you this morning, do you lie in wickedness? I hope not. I mean, you're the amen choir. But this is the thing. You've got to search the scriptures for clarification. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, he wants you to have a new nature. He doesn't want you to lie in wickedness. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. The standard of Christ reveals, it illuminates our need for forgiveness. The more you examine the word of God, the more you realize, you know what? I need something, and what I need is forgiveness from a God that's righteous and true and holy. And you know, the way to get that is through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this morning, I pray that everybody under the sound of my voice has come to that place in your life where you have understood that it is because not only of Adam's sin, uh, but not only because of the world system, but because ultimately we have to take responsibility for our own proclivity to follow our own flesh and our own pride, or lustful eyes, and our own pride of life. And that leads us in a place where we're separated from God. And so this morning, I, I don't know who's saved and who's not, but if you're here and you're not saved, you need to get saved. You need to trust Jesus Christ. He's the only one, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that can deliver you from death. And he'll do it if you put your faith in him. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You've got to come to that place where you realize that the Bible really means what it says, for all have sinned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, all but Jesus. And that's why he is the standard of righteousness. Instead of hating on Jesus, we need to receive Jesus. Because you know what? Otherwise, we're going to make our bed. We're going to lie with the wicked. And God doesn't want that for us, or he wouldn't have sent his only begotten son. And for us Christians, we've got to remember what it was like to be lost. And we've got to make sure that we take the word of God where it needs to go on time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you for this time just to meditate upon the scripture and look at these things uh, that, uh, <clears throat> that, the, that will tempt us, Lord, in these three areas. Lord, they're very clear. They're from the word of God. That this world system is directly opposed to us. But Lord, we are here to follow you faithfully. And Lord, frankly, it's no challenge if we simply believe your word, if we simply walk it by faith, not by sight. And so with heads bowed and eyes closed, nobody looking around, if you're here this morning and you're like, Brian, uh, you are ringing the bell for me. I need to be saved. This really wasn't a salvation message, but if that's you, I just want to pray.